Um, merci beaucoup déjà aux organisateurs de m'avoir associé à cette très belle journée qui est en train d'ouvrir toute une série de perspectives très intéressantes. Je ne parle pas là où il faudrait parler, alors je ne bouge plus. Um, donc, euh, j'ai maintenant le plaisir de, de présenter, animer, présenter la prochaine session qui s'intéresse s'intitule « Libre échange Free Exchanges um, » parce que effectivement je pense qu'ici, on va être assez bilingue. Um, donc, c'est pour cette raison-là et surtout pour euh, pouvoir mieux accueillir nos intervenants en britannique qui se trouvent au Royaume-Uni en ce moment, mais grâce aux merveilles de la technologie, se trouvent également avec nous, que si vous n'y voyez pas d'inconvénient, moi je vais maintenant switch into English because I think that's going to be easier for everybody um, and particularly for our two speakers. Now then, um, est-ce qu'on a déjà les PowerPoints? Est-ce que tout est bon? Oui. <laughs> okay. Um, because we're going to start... Is, is the screen sharing functional? Can you maybe start sharing your PowerPoint? Francesca Daito, I believe, yeah? Super, lovely, thank you. So, um, first of all, I have the pleasure to introduce Francesca Daito, although I also see Frankie Daito. Which do you prefer? Frankie is better. Frankie is better, okay, <laughs> right then. So, let's go in for more. Frankie Daito, um, you've studied at... University of Cambridge, um, your bachelor degree and then your MPhil at Trinity Hall, Cambridge. And you are currently, um, your thesis is directed by Caroline Vanek. You are currently writing a thesis concerning the reception and the appropriation of an early Renaissance, 15th century from what I gather, um, during the period which you've established between 1850 and 1930. So that's your principal um, chronological limits at the moment. And you're studying more particularly the reinvention, the rediscovery of this Renaissance, but also the reinvention of it in a number of domains, including performance, fiction, and travel writing. And you are particularly going to be concentrating on Nathalie Barney, Maud Crutwell, André Gide, Abby Valberg, Vernon Lee, and Michael Field, about whom you're about to speak now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. And as you can see, I've slightly um, changed the title to now real, read Michael Field at the edge of art history rather than the original uh, Michael Field and imagined Italy, but Italy will remain uh, in the foreground. So in 1901, the British artist Charles Ricketts presented his friend Catherine Bradley with a pendant containing the miniature of Edith Cooper, Catherine's niece, lover and creative partner. Catherine was overcome with emotion at the gift, recording the event in Works and Days, the journal she had shared with Edith since the 1880s. I look down, her face is there, my eyes grow wet. Edith is shown as if in an Elizabethan miniature, but also a Quattrocento portrait in profile against an azurite background decorated with two interlocking rings and two initials. The doubleness at play is significant. The interlocking rings work in the traditional symbolism of a marriage dedication, evoking the vows that Catherine and Edith had privately taken with each other, subsequently referring to each other as husband and wife. The initials stand for the authorship of the two, an M and an F, meaning Michael Field, the pseudonym under, the, under which the two authors published. Catherine was known as Michael, and Edith as Field. Together they were Michael Field and signed off contractual letters as such. The miniature and its manner of exchange exemplifies the collaborative method of working that Michael Field dedicated their life to. Earlier in the journal, Edith had already written her own entry about the gift, noting that what actually happened on the day, she, meaning Catherine, shall write. Edith instead recorded her response to the gift, 
noting that the shadows are pure gold and the serpents of hair pure gold, thus evoking a host of associations familiar to her visual vocabulary, well versed as she was with most European collections of Italian Renaissance portraits. Having examined the miniature on her own, the two then sat down in the evening to look at the miniature together, and Catherine read Edith an unpublished poem of Edith's called Old Ivories. The poem describes the encounter with an unnamed figure who is standing next to a window filled with golden ivories. The narrator is moved by pleasure of similitude, since this figure seemed to be comparable in beauty to the ivories themselves. Quote, herself a beautiful, uh, herself a perfect thing. She stood by that time burnished reliquary, simple as Aphrodite by the sea, close quote. For Edith, the miniature and poem are perfect companions. In fact, she exclaims that the poem is that which the miniature simply illustrates. As Catherine narrates, Edith herself becomes the object of her own poem, an authorial inversion that entwines text and image, human and artwork. As the object is held and loved, the gift exchange facilitates a poetic intervention and an intimacy that is at once publicly displayed and privately recorded. This is a type of art history that, whilst well documented for the early modern period, stands in contrast to the professionalization narrative typically afforded the end of the 19th century. The miniature was given to Catherine by Charles Ricketts, himself in a comparable romantic and creative relationship with the artist Charles Shannon. The four were close friends and inhabited a world in which the boundaries of art and life frequently seemed to dissolve. On meeting Shannon in 1894, Edith noted his amazing proximity to works of art, that he is exactly like one of the comely angels of Della Francesca, the face round, the features round, a smiling sobriety of expression, a perfect Umbrian Gabriel who only wants his lily stem on his shoulder. On another occasion, she wonders at his Giorgione skin with the Venetian gold faded out of it. The home, as well as the museum, became in the hands of Michael Field the opportunity for an encounter with artworks. The literary significance of Michael Field has been well recognized over the past 25 years. Comparatively little attention, however, with the notable exception of Hilary Fraser, has been paid to Michael Field's contribution to the history of art. This paper aims to somewhat rectify the situation, placing their publications on art Effigies from 1890 and Sight and Song from 1892 in the context of their aesthetic engagement more generally. Found in their letters and journals, Michael Field minutely detailed their responses to artworks, shifting between so-called poetic objectivity and deliberately subjective, even fictional accounts. In this sense, they neatly reflect a moment in the discipline of art history in which the boundaries between amateur and professional had not yet been fully determined and in which the archival mode had not yet come to dominate. Shifting in their tastes from antique art to early Renaissance art over the course of the 1890s, they are testament to a generation reckoning with the legacies of the likes of Jacob Burkhard, Giovanni Morelli and Walter Pater. They traveled extensively in Europe when they could afford it, keeping up to date with the latest publications in European literature and art history essentially educating themselves and for, perhaps for that reason exhibiting occasional crises of confidence over their poetic and scholarly authority. Their skills and attribution were, however, valued by none, less than, none the less than Bernard Berenson, who wrote to them asking their advice on such matters. They had first met Berenson in the early Italian gallery of the Louvre in 1890. From the beginning, their stormy friendship was framed by the Renaissance and would continue to be so. Bernard praised Edith's skill in reading pictures, encouraging her to develop a form of criticism he called coquille. Edith, in love with Bernard, became increasingly disillusioned with the intellectual integrity of the critic. As the couple strayed away from the Berensons, the Italian Renaissance too disappeared from sight and would only be revived a few years later through their friendship with Shannon and Ricketts. This sudden disappearance of their object of study suggests that we cannot see Field's art history as a dispassionate affair. 
blending person and artwork, their relationships informed and were informed by their experience of art. In the case of Catherine and Edith's relationship, artworks again and again function as vehicles through which same-sex eroticism could be explored. This is particularly the case in the letters between Catherine and Edith in the late 1880s, when Catherine was traveling through Italy. Sapphic desire directs Catherine's choice of artworks, singling out almost exclusively female depictions. The absence of male desire, rather than its substitution, is made explicitly present when Catherine describes a statue of Venus, the perfect woman, perfect in and of herself, with not thought of man, no entreaty for his love, yet with breasts so sweet one longs to drink from them. This urge for a tactile interaction dominates the letters. Edith asks Catherine to kiss artworks for her. This morning, you will kiss the perfect at Luca and thank God for having sent her on earth and Jacopo della Quercia for having kept her there. I have sent a pilgrim kiss. May it reach you in time to be pressed by your lips on her shrine. Just like Winkelmann touching the sculptures of Rome, Catherine dutifully kisses the statue and reenacts the moment for Edith, creating an imaginative staging of the scene that Edith at home could experience. I bear on my lips the marble of Ilaria's brow. I walked straight to the left transept and saw her and by and by all left me and I kissed her on the calm forehead, the tremulously sweet lips, the sweet round chin. As Catherine kisses and bows before female statues and portraits, Edith also creates an erotic visual surrounding for herself, describing a photograph of Catherine as if a sculpture. Quote, you always sleep with me in effigy, for your portrait under my, is under my pillow and I kiss it, close quote. And even directly compares her to Laria, quote, your portrait, like Laria's effigy, is being worn by kisses pressed on it. These letters complicate any clear authorship behind Michael Field. If their authorial personality remains quite distinct in the letters, they are certainly creating a shared vision, one that stretches over the boundaries of place and also of time by participating in the age-old tradition of tactile engagement with antique sculptures. In the journal, their identity becomes more and more entangled. Whilst hands are individually recognizable, at points they switch seamlessly between hands and in other moments record each other's observations on art. These observations read like Vernon Lee, Lee's gallery diaries, one day describing themselves to be too tired for anything but the earliest masters, Giotto or Lorenzetti, or after a fight with the Berensons, a despair that none of the pictures will speak to them, remaining simply dead canvas to us. The journals also contain drafts of work in different hands that would be eventually published under their single name, revealing a fairly consistent method within the journals of observing singly and reworking as a double. This is, for instance, the case in their long-standing infatuation with Giorgione's Venus. It is first mentioned in 1891 somewhat briefly by Catherine, who admiringly mentions the curves and undulations of the body. A month later, Edith describes an afternoon with Catherine and Berenson looking over photographs, including the Giorgione Venus, which Edith is astounded by. I have never seen anything, anything more consummately lovely than the Venus of Dresden. The limbs repeat the feminine amplitude of the earth. She lies under the great air in the midst of a rich grave landscape. This appropriation of the, lamp, of the landscape as a female space evokes the pastoralism of their Sappho poems, which had been published in 1889 in a collection entitled Long Ago. Unlike the Sappho poems, however, which had worked off the 1885 English translations of Henry Wharton, the evidence here shifts from the verbal to the visual, further elaborated when the couple traveled to Dresden and saw the picture in the gallery. A long description begins, and there she is, Giorgione's Venus, this is perfect womanhood. The earth is holy ground about her. It ha has itself the round, unconscious curves of her sex. There is in the picture that ideal sympathy between woman and the land. The affinity between woman and nature that transforms the body into a topography displaces the by then conventional historical claim 
that Giorgione's landscape marked a departure or innovation in Venetian painting. As Field turned these descriptions into a poem, the same features recur again, finally to be published in the collection of poems, sight and song. The professed aim of the volume was an exercise in translation. As their preface stated, the aim was to translate into verse what the lines and colors of certain chosen pictures sing in themselves, to express not so much what these pictures are to the poet, but rather what poetry they objectively incarnate. It meant therefore, removing the subjective enjoyment of the viewer in order to listen to the paintings themselves, a subtle reconfiguration of Walter Pater's criticism. As many scholars have recognized, the fields in this collection are clearly participating in the antique tradition of ekphrasis. Critics such as W.B. Yeats expressed outright hostility to this approach, describing that, quote, this interesting, suggestive, and thoroughly unsatisfactory book is a new instance of the growing tendency to make critical faculty do the work of the creative, close quote. Although Yeats might be surprised to hear it, I basically agree with his criticism. Leaving aside the poetic significance of Michael Field's work, the volume represents a remarkable intervention into the field of art history that sidesteps dominant academic me methods available at the time. In valuing such a sidestep, I take my cue from Shannon Fisker's important text on the reception of the classics by Victorian women. Dismantling the common preconception that the classics were the exclusive preserve of a male elite, Fisk charts an alternative history of Hellenism, a type of Hellenism that she calls heretical, in that it was a forbidden study, taking place at home, not at the university, often reliant on secondhand knowledge and therefore ripe for reinterpretation. Fisk describes such reinterpretations as instances of the counter discursive possibilities developed by Victorian women. I would like to add the Renaissance to this intellectual matrix. We might like to consider the introduction of erotics as one instance of the counter discursive possibility of Michael Field's art history. In the hands of Field, Botticelli's women are turned into relentlessly contemporary triumphant figures. Sitting for a long time in front of Venus and Mars, Edith records, how tragic are the two great figures, male and female, he sleeping in illusion, she already above it, and watchful lest it cheat her even again. She is modern, cold, she is sad, she is awake. The Renaissance becomes modern and female, not a femme fatale, but an alert, autonomous individual. Field makes, re makes frequent reference to the modern and modernity in the diaries, unproblematically coupling the Renaissance with both. Edith, as she is admiring the best work of Shannon that she calls modern in effect, is reminded of the reliefs of Donatello and Luca della Robbia. After the famous rediscovery of Botticelli's Palla and Centaur in the Pitti Palace in 1895, the emotional coldness of the modern is again declared. After some difficulty, the fields manage to arrange to view it in person and they record it to be a gift to the century for how impersonal the face. Two years earlier, a thorough redecoration of their study in the attempt to be contemporaneous had prompted the removal of English art from their walls and replaced by reproductions of Italian art. These domestic alterations were clearly integral to Fields's wider critical agenda. The same diary entry explains the need to replace the photographs because today's dreams and desires, these are the things to be expressed on our walls, in our furniture, in our dress. The Renaissance, on some level, was literally present for Field in their home, creating a history that could be handled and desired, much like the miniature. Thanking Berenson for sending over a reproduction of Flora's head from Botticelli's spring, Catherine writes that, before her eyes and mouth, I am dumb. She really is most terribly alive, herself, herself through every pore of her skin. I am laying down my pen to stare at her. This practice of studying from photographs follows Morelli's call to establish a new practice of scientific criticism. And photographic reproductions certainly formed an indispensable tool for most art historians of the time. 
The fields, however, transform these impassive objects into living creatures, taking them out from under the imaginary microscope of the connoisseur. Edith is given a reproduction of Giorgione's Venus for her birthday by Catherine. The largest picture in the house, they describe becoming grave before its beauty and anxiously record the day it is taken to be framed. When they receive a reproduction of Timoteo Viti's Madeleine, they dance before joy, before the soft photograph. At home and abroad, they describe long evenings and afternoons poring over photographs, alone, together, and with companions. These reproductions facilitated friendships and extended the boundaries of the home. Staying at Berenson's house in Fiesle while he is away, they write to him saying, how could we be otherwise than happy and at home when we wait to the same pictures and influence and books as at Durden's and record their sadness at leaving? We shall miss the austere sackcloth walls, the poetic photographs. A year later, Edith is still remembering Bernd Berenson through place, mourning the loss of his intimate photographs. How can we account for this kind of domestic rendition of art history? We find it scattered through their friendships. Herbert Horn, creating a settee for Field's so-called Botticelli room, tells the Fields that his sprays of dry butcher's broom have an early Florentine look. Berenson writes to the Fields that his study is like that of St. Jerome's in the Carpaccio fresco. The Fields call him the Fawn at his suggestion for many years. These playful forms of make-believe mark the second counter discursive possibility offered by Fields' writings. In transforming Berenson, their guide to the Renaissance, into an antique fawn, Field re reveal a new intersection between the classics and the comparatively recent field of early Renaissance studies. In fact, it is even true to say that the two productively informed each other, as when Field exclaimed that a reproduction of Melozzo da Forli's Angels is full of Bacchic life, or when they visit the country house of the Medici Villa Carreggi and recite lines from Sappho. Such intersections suggest not only the pliability of the imagined past at the hands of Michael Field, but also that the Fields should be considered alongside colleagues such as Vernon Lee and Abby Warburg, both of whom worked under the mantle of reception history, chanting the influence of antiquity in the Renaissance. By offering both sapphic revisionism and domestic reenactment, Field developed an alternative avenue of historical research, one that at times threatened to destroy the boundary between the scholar and their work. By thinking together, writing together, desiring together, as amateurs and without institutional support, Michael Field revised the familiar period model of the male art historian between the feminized artwork or the lone figure struggling in the archive. Their example, furthermore, gives prompt to reconsider what exactly constituted art history in this period, whether, in fact, we need a more generous approach in order to truly recognise the contribution of women at the end of the 19th century. Michael Field, though, were faithfully aware that their work was not in line with the privileged tradition of male scholarship. Early in their shared diary, Catherine reckons with her exclusion from the homoerotic world of antiquity and the Renaissance, that there was, quote, one sentence of Pater's, which I would not say I could never forgive because I recognized its justice, but from which I suffered and which was hard to bear, that in which he speaks of the scholarly conscience as male. The same phrase hauntingly recurs later by Edith when she tries to explain her frustration at being unable to talk in the manner her male companions would like her to. She says, I spoil all, I shake from my person all poetry. I demonstrate that women cannot have a scholarly conscience. I am an occasion for cynicism. Yet despite these anxieties, feel constantly strive to reform and refine their manner of working. In her final entry for 1894, Edith reflects on the past year. Our love of art is more central again not feeling out from the surface of ourselves, restless, experimental, shallow, but under our protection, warmed by our most intimate vitality, which means by our own wills and emotions. This entry neatly captures Michael Field's radical, doubled form of art history. Thank you.
those connections. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think what we're going to do after that very interesting contribution is we're now going to go straight to London. We're going to go from Cambridge to London. We're going to ask Thomas Hughes to, to um, offer his, his paper on Ruskin and Pater, which is all the more, I think, um, justified because of the interesting re references to Pater at the end of Frankie's paper. So, then afterwards, we'll go to the question. So I now have the pleasure of introducing Thomas Hughes, um, who, I've got a piece of paper here, I know I've got a piece of paper here. Here we go, that's what I'm looking for. Um, you studied English language and literature at Balliol College, Oxford. You then went to the Courtauld to do an MA and subsequently a PhD. Um, your research has been centred on Ruskin and Pater. You've also been looking, from what I've gathered, at Whistler, Rossetti and Burne Jones. So there are some fascinating networks there which you're studying. And you're very interested in art theory, particularly of the second half of the 19th century, and you look more particularly at questions of art theory in relation to language, to painting, to sculpture, to form, to the body, to sexuality, to social class, to religion and agnosticism, to time, and all of that also seen from a political point of view. Did I get the full list there? I hope so. So anyway, thank you very much, Thomas, thank you. So now Thomas Hughes, who is now going to speak to us on an odd couple, John Ruskin and Walter Pater. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, indeed. And um, thank you, Merci, to Victor, Pascal, Charlotte, and Francois René for um, organizing the conference and, and having me here. I'm delighted. So, um, as far as we know, uh, John Ruskin and Walter Pater were not an actual couple, um, though if there are any discoveries to be made along those lines, I shall certainly um, eat my hat. <laughs> On the surface of things, the Victorian writers, Ruskin and Pater, represented different poles. Ruskin consistently related aesthetic experience and the function of making and consuming art to politics, and ultimately, God. Pater infamously circumscribed meaning within the narrow chamber of the individual mind, positing in the preface to his studies in the history of the Renaissance of 1873, that the basis of aesthetic thinking rests in asking these questions. What is this song or picture? this engaging personality presented in life or in a book to me? What effect does it really produce on me? Does it give me pleasure? And if so, what sort of degree of pleasure? Ruskin's aesthetics were oriented towards the Gothic, Pater's to the classical, although they both turned their attention to the other side at some point in their careers. So we have, generally speaking, Ruskin, the communitarian, communist and Tory, and Pater, the solipsist, epicurean, subjective, aestheticist. Liberal, question mark, I've put, because I'm, I'm still really not sure where I would locate Pater in mundane political terms. But broadly speaking, religious Ruskin, pagan Pater. Of course, beneath the surface, things are a great deal more complex. Remaining at a sort of macro level for a bit longer, it would be possible to map the ebbs of Ruskin's supposed retreats into moralism onto the flows in Pater's aestheticism. For example, it is no coincidence that Ruskin gets more political, more interested in questions of economy and the national organization of material goods and art education and so on during the 1860s, just when aestheticism as an ideology and loosely a movement in Victorian culture is starting to get going with Pater soon to ride its wave. 
Ruskin ends up back in Oxford in 1871, when he is appointed the first Slade Professor of Fine Art. So on and off during the 1870s, which were arguably Pater's heyday, both of these men were present in the same university town, lecturing, in Ruskin's case, and writing, in Pater's, on similar issues, coming from different angles. So it would also be very possible to zero in on the Oxford years and try to piece together the covert conversations and competitions in which Ruskin and Pater were undoubtedly engaged from respectively Brasenose College and Corpus Christi. My own research, however, has ended up taking a broader perspective on the hunch that Pater would have wanted to get to grips with and in turn stake his claims on Ruskin's preeminent texts on art, architecture and beauty, The Stones of Venice, 1851 to 53, and Modern Painters, which goes on and on and on from 1843 to 1860. We know Pater worked extremely slowly. His essays, in spite of their remarkably all-encompassing effects, their gigantic, pervading atmospheres, as well as their extreme delicacy, are remarkably, almost painfully condensed. From this perspective, what emerges is an idea of Ruskin and Pater, not so much as rivals engaged in intense competition and rebuttal, but rather as long-standing, albeit ambivalent, collaborators, engaged in a highly intimate collaboration of move and counter-move, allusion and subversion, homage and memorialization. This chimes with the odd fact that throughout their careers, Ruskin and Pater barely acknowledged each other's existence. Something else which emerges from adopting this perspective is the possibility of understanding the relationship between Ruskin and Pater's art history and contemporary art. Just like Pater, aestheticist painters and sculptors were responding to Ruskin over long, drawn out trajectories. In fact, they were often sucked into the Ruskin Ruskin Pater conversation. Ultimately, what emerges then is an elaborate and messy network of aesthetic and political thinking, crisscrossing the verbal and the visual, and structuring the formation of the Victorian avant garde, in which history, nature, and morality are not altogether abandoned, but recast in terms and forms which are understood to communicate more viscerally in a more embodied way with the late Victorian viewer, with Ruskin and Pater right at its centre. For we will be seeing that the body and bodily pleasure are the beating heart of Ruskin's aesthetics. But finally, to close this preliminary reflection, I propose that reading Ruskin through the lens of Pater's and aestheticism's appropriations and adaptations of him reveals in a particularly clear way nuggets buried deep in Ruskin's thinking, structures of Ruskin's thought and feeling, which we would do well to bring to light. That is, I do not mean to propose here a Ruskin in the passive and a Pater in the active role. Pater's active engagement with and transformation of Ruskin reveals the extent to which Ruskin's work continued to enjoy an extremely high level of agency in late Victorian culture. Ruskin's work was, and is in many ways, alive. In the rest of this paper, I focus on three quarrelsome encounters between Ruskin and Pater. I'll briefly set out some of the moves and counter moves I see them making, the subversions and homages, in relation to J.M.W. Turner and Colour, Michelangelo and the Body, and Amiens Cathedral in France and the Gothic. First of all, Turner and Colour. In modern painters, Ruskin consistently reveres the colorists, the Venetians, especially Titian. And he categorically goes against Vasari and um, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who imported Vasari into English art theory, by praising pretty consistently colour, colore, overdrawing, disegno. The whole treatise, Modern Painters, is after all a defense 
of the supposed English descendant of Venice, J.M.W. Turner. This is Turner's approach to Venice. And yet Ruskin leaves his most substantial statement on colour until near the end of the last volume of Modern Painters. I should say Ruskin's writing on colour and Turner can be amazing, like when he describes Turner's quote, mosaic effect, a fantasy of inventive arrangement corresponding to that of Beethoven, with its unrivaled concurrence and expression of texture or construction of surfaces, its bloom luster or intricacy, end quote. But these quotations are taken from a distended footnote right at the end of Modern Painters 5 that goes on and on and on. In fact, the note is quite mad. I will summarize its claims for color. First, Ruskin reaffirms the primacy of abstract form, by which he means drawing, over abstract color, whatever abstract means. Though subordinate, however, color involves an unforgiving obligation to truth. Feebleness of color, such as Michelangelo's, is excusable, but full color must be either true, in which case it will be worthy of a Venetian, or false, in which case it will be terrible and cannot be redeemed by drawing, however perfect. Veronese, Tintoretto, Correggio, Reynolds, despite his discourses, and Turner, are described as the supreme colorists. After backtracking and saying that drawing, not color, is necessary, Ruskin then says, I believe, however, it will be found, ultimately, that the perfect gifts of color and form always go together, which puts them on an ideal equal footing, although in practice the majority of even great rather than perfect artists, he says, have been good at drawing. I think there is more going on here than bad planning, bad writing. Ruskin takes the opportunity of this crammed note to overcharge color with value. As I said, for Ruskin, color is truth. So when dealing with color, you are dealing with the most difficult things of all, for Ruskin, facts. Then things get even wilder, considering this is Ruskin we're talking about, quote, as color is the type of love, it resembles it in all its modes of operation. And in practical work of human hands, it sustains changes of worthiness precisely like those of human sexual love. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that conventionally in Western culture, disegno, drawing, was gendered masculine and colore, color, feminine. So what's interesting here is that Ruskin's privileging of feminine color over masculine drawing seems to run into trouble. On the one hand, Ruskin steps back from the complete elevation of color over drawing. He chickens out. Another way of putting it though, is that Ruskin establishes a radical ambivalence between the two categories. This is unstable inherently, hence the bizarre and hectic footnote. But this instability is highly generative and proves, I argue, highly provocative. The boundaries demarcating the masculine and the feminine are somehow blurred, like in Turner's drawing or William Holman Hunt's Ivy in the light of the world. And it is hard to separate the one from the other. Color, like Victorian women, still gets it in the neck in the end. The moral responsibility is ultimately located on this side of the equation. Nevertheless, Ruskin's epic treatise concludes on a note of radical ambivalence concerning color, gender, and sexuality. I argue that a famous passage of Pater's is picking up on Ruskin's ambivalence and taking it all the way. In his 1877 essay, The School of Giorgione, Pater repeats the words drawing and coloring over and over and over again. His ambiguous and highly compressed wording gradually seems to combine drawing and color until they become indis indistinguishable from each other. So that, quote, in its primary aspect, a great picture has no more definite message for us than an accidental play of sunlight and shadow for a few moments on the wall or floor, 
caught as the colors are in an eastern carpet, but refined upon. If we think of Peter's essays responding to Ruskin and combining drawing and color, we get a new way of reading Peter's most famous statement that all art constantly aspires towards the condition of music. For while in all other works of art it is possible to distinguish the matter from the form, yet it is the constant effort of art to obliterate this distinction. That this form, this mode of handling, should become an end in itself, should penetrate every part of the matter, this is what all art constantly strives after and achieves in different degrees. So this is not Pater as Greenberg, or not just that, by form, Pater seems to mean the refining upon of light that we just heard in the quotation before. Color, in a word, insofar, insofar as color is distinguishable from drawing in Pater's essay. Part of Pater's ingenious irony here, of course, is that in English, form is a substitute for disenio. In this sense, Pater seems to be saying, painting aspires to the condition where what it depicts is a function of the way it is handled in color. The more a picture emulates music, the more it begins and ends in color. Pater then takes up Ruskin's ambivalence and crystallizes it into this very nice and neat allusion to the paintings of James McNeil Whistler. This is his nocturne, a musical term from Chopin, Blue and Silver, Chelsea of 1871. The way Pater crystallizes things into beautiful paradoxes is very un-Ruskinian, what with Ruskin's lengthy ambivalences and long footnotes. But arguably Pater's very conception is a logical conclusion of theoretical instabilities introduced by Ruskin. This also gives us a way of thinking about some of Pater's racier passages, such as the one about touching in Titian's The Concert in terms of Ruskin. But actually, it is to a racy passage in early Ruskin that I now turn today. Ruskin's denunciation of Michelangelo in a lecture in Oxford in 1871, so quite late on, as degenerate and body obsessed, has obscured the fact that Ruskin wrote in extremely enthusiastic terms about the Italian master in the second volume of Modern Painters in 1846. I'm summarizing because of time, but essentially Ruskin focuses on two sculptures, Bacchus and St. Matthew, relishing Michelangelo's depiction of muscle and flesh for its vigor, energy, and imaginative depth. The white lassitude of joyous limbs, panther-like yet passive, fainting with their own delight that gleam among the pagan formalisms of the Uffizi, far away, separating themselves in their lustrous lightness as the waves of an alpine torrent do by their dancing from the dead stone, though the stones be as white as they, for example. Actually, Ruskin's reverie on the Michelangelesque body comes at an important time in Ruskin's second volume, when he is formulating a category of imagination called the imagination penetrative, this kind of imagination delves down into matter and tastes of the very essence of life, presenting it on the surface of the sculpture or picture as the body for all to see. Above all, this imagination is about a reverence for life itself, one which Ruskin presents in strikingly homoerotic as well as deeply religious terms. Bodily attraction and sensation can be conduits to the sacred in Ruskin here. Michelangelo says Ruskin had this penetrative imagination above anyone. Pater's 1871 Michelangelo essay is usually read as a repost to Ruskin's Oxford lecture of earlier, that, uh, of earlier that year, not in light of the modern painter's two comments. I won't go into why Ruskin does change his position on Michelangelo, or why I think he does, but suffice it to say that the 1871 lecture of Ruskin's is rhetorical, stands on its own, although it's also very serious in the points it makes. But, I suggest, 
Pater's enthusiastic, homoerotically charged analysis of Michelangelo's sculpture is clearly responding to Ruskin in 1846. Actually, in Pater's essay, a lot of the emphasis falls on Michelangelo's Platonism and his deathliness. The art historian Alex Potts, among, among others, has commented on how, in this essay, Pater seems to be skeptical that sculptural form, what he calls hard realism, is capable of the greatest artistic communication. It's not until his much later essays on Greek sculpture that we see Pater coming to a more resolved position on sculpture and the body. In Pater's essay on Michelangelo, then, he's at an intermediate point, still working through some of the implications in Ruskin's first analysis. And as I said, for Pater in 1871, emphasis finally falls on death, which is actually much closer to what Ruskin is saying in 1871 himself. Aestheticist artists, I suggest, are likely to have responded to this, assimilating Michelangelo through this Ruskin Pater complex. This is Edward Byrne Jones's extremely captivating and strange The Tree of Forgiveness of 1882, which I think you can see combines evident pre raphaelitism with something um, very far from pre raphaelite It's bursting with life, yet deathly, clearly Michelangelesque, religious and secular, and also rather ambiguous in terms of gender and sexuality with the male um, arguably in the passive role there. Thirdly, Amiens and the Gothic. In his essay on Amiens Cathedral published in 1894, the year he died, Pater offers a pastiche of that quintessential Ruskinian aesthetic, the Gothic. There are passages when I sometimes wonder whether Pater is mimicking a tour guide with Ruskinian pretensions, partly because of these passages' sheer plainness. Quote, a false representation only frustrates the proper ripening of his work, and I could go on. On a more substantial note, Pater also historicizes Ruskin's Gothic, which Ruskin conceived ultimately as an ahistorical ideal in the Stones of Venice. In Pater's essay, the Gothic culminates at Amiens because of specific historical and political forces, because of the French Commune. In Pater's presentation, the Gothic also coincides with a kind of secularization of Christianity. What Pater leaves us with in this rather odd essay is a sense of awe at architectural and sculptural forms still standing after so many centuries filled with the human history. It is a sort of farewell to the Gothic, one that roots us back in the 19th century with our feet firmly on the ground. I'll read this very quickly before concluding. Very ancient light this seems at any rate, as if it had been lying in prison thus for long centuries, were in fact the light over which the great vault originally closed, now become almost substance of thought, one might fancy, a mental object or medium. We are reminded that after all, we must of necessity look on the great churches of the Middle Ages with other eyes than those who built or first worshipped in them. That there is something verily worth having and a just equivalent for something else lost in the mere effect of time. And that the salt of all aesthetic study is in the question, what, precisely what is this to me? So in terms of what we think of as art history today and what this odd, odd couple can contribute to it, I would say a great deal, given lots of factors, but primarily at the moment because of a renewed interest, it seems to me, in subjectivity and its role in art, art historical investigations. Rusk and Pater, for example, aren't really interested in distancing some, themselves from the object, as we heard is so important to Warburg. In my own work, I find the productive tension between Ruskin and Pater rich ground in terms of the history of art and in terms of it, the methodologies of its study. Keeping both in view attunes one to the best these writers have to offer and also to the problems in both, which the one makes evident in the other. Thank you.
you very much. Thank you for that um, very interesting contribution. So we now have these two fascinating uh, views of British art history, late 19th century. So I'm sure there are all kinds of questions which we're going to be starting to, to bring together from this. Particularly, I think, to start with, what's very interesting in both of your papers is that there is so much insistence during this period on what we often believe to be a very non-British way of doing things, which is a very subjective and very sensuous and sensual way of talking about um, art and art forms. It reminds me very much of the anecdote that, that people recounted concerning the beginnings of art history, actually in, in universities in, in Britain, and which came remarkably late. And one of the comments which was being made in an Oxford dinner party was, the problem with art history is that you need to talk about works of art like you talk about women. <laughs> and that was the, the way in which basically people were trying to explain why there wasn't so much interest in art history. But it's very, very interesting. Uh, before I ask you some questions, and I've got some, I'll throw it open to the room. Um, que ça soit clair, si vous préférez vous exprimer en français, moi je peux faire l'interprète. Si vous voulez vous lancer en anglais, allez-y. Donc, euh, est-ce qu'il y a des questions, est-ce qu'il y a des, des, des observations, des remarques, des commentaires pour, euh... Cécilia, je veux bien profiter de tes services <rire> de traductrice. <rire> Donc, I'm going to translate the question, OK J'avais euh, une question pour chacun. Euh, merci pour vos communications passionnantes, déjà. Euh, et une question qui relève, en fait, du, du nom. Euh, François René, dans son introduction, a, a soulevé euh, la question de l'intimité. Effectivement, je pense que le couple imp implique ce qu'on souhaite montrer, ce qu'on souhaite cacher. Donc, comment aussi on se présente au, au public et en public Et le nom euh, euh, a, euh, je pense, une une importance euh, certaine. Euh, alors, ma première question va s'adresser à, à, à Frankie au sujet de, de Michael Field. On est euh, à l'époque victorienne, à un moment où, où les femmes vont aussi choisir l'anonymat. Euh, je pense à Elizabeth Isley qui, avant son mariage, va plutôt publier euh, sous, euh, euh, de manière anonyme euh, ou euh, en choisissant l'épithète « by a lady ». Euh, à Anna Jameson aussi pour son roman euh, euh, Diary of an Ennuyé qui va le publier euh, euh, anonymement. Euh, là, il y a un nom, c'est un pseudonyme, mais il existe. Et je me demandais euh, euh, qu'est-ce qu'il permet, ce nom Alors effectivement, il ne dévoile pas euh, euh, l'identité de, de ces deux femmes, il cache aussi quelque chose, mais euh, il, il est, est une manière finalement d'officialiser en creux une union de deux personnes euh, de, de femmes qui s'aiment et donc euh, je voulais euh, Frankie t'entendre justement sur, euh, sur ce que permet euh, le nom et, euh, et, et à Thomas je voulais euh, lui poser une question euh, sur Euphemia Ruskin euh, qui était euh, l'épouse de John Ruskin et euh, le mariage <rire> n'a pas, enfin elle a demandé le divorce parce que le mariage n'avait pas été consommé justement euh, parce que, soi-disant, il n'aimait pas son corps de femme. Est-ce que tu peux resituer euh, le, le, le mariage que Raskin forme avec Euphémia par rapport aussi à, à, à la relation qu'il va entretenir avec Walter Pater au niveau chronologique Voilà. C'est long. Um, OK. Um, translation Yeah. Okay. Right then. So um, I'll translate. The question for Frankie is. I think I can jump in. Um, you can jump in. You're okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the question of their pseudonym is a really interesting one because so early on in their career they they actually use a different pseudonym. They publish first um, as Aaron and Isla Lay. Um, and then when they first start publishing as Michael Field, they get a really good reception to their, um, their work. Um, but Robert Browning lets the cat out of the bag and shows that Michael Field is not actually one male, but two women. And interest in their work suddenly drops. Um, and so they've had some admirers who have been writing to them who actually retract their interest and in saying, I'm sorry, I thought I was writing to a man who would think in a similar way to me. So on one level, Michael Field is used 
purely from a practical perspective to legitimize their work. But there's also um, a lot of gender play that they um, enjoy. So it's distinctly that Catherine is Michael and that Edith is Field. Edith also is known as Henry to Catherine. And th these are names that their friends would use for them. So they barely, you know, barely ever get called Catherine um, and Edith. Um, and they enjoy taking on these masculine personas. So Edith gets her hair cut and she becomes, she gets born sort of as, as Henry. And then Catherine is able to nurse her um, as, as a mother. Um, and you know, the, the fact that they're also aunt and niece, that there's lots of kind of different dynamics going on between them. So I think that there's kind of two levels to the pseudonym of, of practicality of needing to survive in basically a male oriented world. You know, Vernon Lee is also taking on a, you know, an ambiguously gendered name, um, but also that they need to combine themselves in some way for the production of their work because they always see it as a form of co-production, um, however much we then read later into the journals, but the journals were intended to be published. So there's kind of, yeah, <laughs> lots of different identities going on simultaneously for Michael Field in a way that they really enjoyed, you know, they're dramatic, they like playing up these genders. Thank you. Um, Thomas, do you need translation or not? Oh, oh yes, please, go on. Okay, please. right then, fine. Um, the question for you is, um, we should like to know about Euphemia Ruskin, about this, this marriage with Ruskin, and how do you explain and situate the marriage in terms of Walter Pater, particularly in chronological terms, and the relationship ruskin Pater or relationship, in inverted commas? Yes. Yeah, thank you. It's it's a really good question, and as you all have seen, I'm I'm kind of I'm interested in, in exploring the very evidently complicated sexuality that is there as part of Ruskin's engagement with art. Um, it's there in Michelangelo, and it's there in other ways. Um, I would say, well, it's it's very clear today, isn't it, Stark, that Ruskin's marriage to Ophelia was was a, a completely unproductive one, an uncollaborative one. Um, where really she was not given any role, um, as far as we know, in in his Venetian work, and that this was con uh, and she was there just as his kind of um, companion, but not at all kind of involved in his intellectual work. I would say that Ruskin um, would have been immediately aware of Pater as soon as Pater emerged onto the scene, and he would have been. Um, fascinated by him, and um, um, and you know probably more was more obsessed with Peter than he ever was interested in Ophelia, from what we know. So that's kind of how I would answer it in 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 kind of anecdotal terms. Um, in terms of the chronology, I mean Peter appears in the 1860s. That's as late. It's after Ophelia has has disappeared uh, from Ruskin's life. I, I think if I've got that. I think that's pretty right. Um, so the way I would kind of answer your question is to pivot back to the writing and to say that um, it's evident right from early on that this is sustained, that there is a very um, complicated and ambiguous sexuality, which is sometimes homoerotic, sometimes totally ambiguous going on in Ruskin's writing about art. And that if we, you know, for some reason that hasn't been explored in and of itself or as a dimension to um, you know, the history of his marriage to Ophelia. And I think um, it's, it's time we did so. So I hope that answers your question. Another question? Quelqu'un d'autre a une question? I've got a, a question for, actually for, for both of you, because there is also a relationship between, between Ruskin and Michael Field, from what I've gathered, because wasn't Catherine Bradley, a disciple of Ruskin at one stage. Was there any recognition between Michael Field and, and Ruskin of each other's work or, or not? Or did they pretend not to know each other? So I think that's for both of you, actually. Start with you <laughs> and then Thomas. <laughs> um, yeah, so Catherine was um, a disciple of the that um, the Guild of St. George and paid the subscription and they were, Ruskin and her were in correspondence. So this is, there's um. A quite a significant age gap between Catherine and Edith. So this is when Catherine is kind of a young woman. Um, 
and she eventually sends a volume of poetry to Ruskin that Ruskin throws in the bin because he says, my life is far too serious to be bothered with poetry. Um, so that causes one kind of uh, rupture. And then Catherine announces to Ruskin that she um, has decided to give up her religion. She's become an atheist and she's converted to the religion of her dog, a Sky Terrier, which is very typical of Michael Field. They like to frame their conversions through their animals and pets. Um, and Ruskin writes back and says that you're too stupid and you've strayed from the path of discipleship. And then after that, they have basically no uh, correspondence with each other. And I think Catherine really pushes that rejection of the the moral and political intrusion um, into their art writings and they adopt much more Pater's um, kind of sensuous approach to art history. Thank you. Thomas, do you find any, um, any reference at all to, to Michael Field in, in Ruskin? I'll have to be honest and I'll, I would have to go to volume 39, the general index, but it's a really, really interesting <laughs> question. Um, I would say we might find something surprising because um, Robert Hewison, who is um, a master of all things Ruskin, has just written a very, very interesting essay on Ruskin and Oscar Wilde, who are not two people we would think of in the same sentence. Again, a very, you know, kind of um, sexually um, unconventional figure, obviously. And yet, um, since Oxford days, Wilde and Ruskin were very close. So it would be kind of interesting to, to imagine or, or, or piece together what, you know, Ruskin might have thought was going on. With, um, with Edith and Catherine. I would say as well to Frankie that the, the whole thing, the Ilaria thing is straight out of Ruskin. Yeah. He was absolutely obsessed with that, with that too. And that's, that, there must be homage to Ruskin going on there, even if they're not, not kind of foregrounding that explicitly. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think definitely if we think about the comparable interest in the early Renaissance and particularly Ruskin's interest in Botticelli's Epora figure, et cetera, I think there's a lot of kind of convergences, but as you say, they're often not wanting to be acknowledged by the fields, I think. Mm. And they're, they're kind of keener to align themselves publicly with the Pater gang than, yeah. than Ruskin, who's, who's rather passe and a bit kind of, well, not passe, but quite kind of, um, well, he's an old, an old curmudgeon by this stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. And even with Pater, they see him as belonging to the older generation um, of art historians as well. They're much more keen to associate themselves with the Berensons and they write distinctly that their work is of the new century. It's not of the old 19th century. Um, so they also kind of come to give up people like Browning and Tennyson as well, which they see as being part of this old vanguard of Victorianism. Thank you very much, merci. Il y a d'autres questions? On a, on a le temps pour une dernière question? Une dernière. Une, une dernière question. Quelqu'un a une question? Alors, if not, then I'm going to ask... Oh, yes, there is a question, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I have a question for uh, Frankie. Uh, first, um, thank you very much for this. Uh, for your paper and um, well you mentioned Ruskin also and you mentioned other people but uh, I would like to go back to Vernon Lee because I think she's quite interesting in a way that she also uh, well this is a nickname because this is uh, Violet Paget as you know but also she wrote with another woman so how can you connect um, you know, Michael Field and Vernon Lee in an intellectual way or, you know, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so they did, they did actually know each other, um, but they didn't get on very well with each other. Um, and part of this, I think, is a, is a kind of direct competition between their forms of art history, which is that microfield are kind of um, repelled by Vernon Lee and Kit because they see them as becoming unmanly and they see them as not being womanly, not keeping a good home, etc. So this is where Michael Field are shown to be fairly conservative in some of their sexual politics, which is kind of surprising considering their gender play and the fact that they're cohabiting, etc. Um, but there's some interesting comments where Michael Field talk about Vernon Lee being 
almost vampiric. And I think that there's a sense that Michael Field are playing on this idea that, which is very much seeded by Berenson, that Vernon Lee has nothing original to contribute, that she's kind of parasitic in her knowledge. Um, and they side with Berenson and, you know, there's going to be the later discussion over plagiarism as well, whether or not Vernon Lee took things, um, took, um, you know, the idea of tactile imagination from, from Berenson. Um, but I think it's really interesting that you do get this, you know, they're basically concerned with similar things. They're both working in Fiesole and they, they just totally fall out with each other because of basically this dispute over the, the sexual politics. And I think that this is perhaps related to the fact that Michael Field are also friends with Havelock Ellis. And when Havelock Ellis talks about sexual inversion, he talks about the woman who, the lesbian as being almost made man uh, through her sexual inversion. And that's something that Michael Field would have never recognized really in themselves. They, uh, you know, they very much like wearing dresses. They see that the home is very integral to their um, their whole project, which is something that Vernon Lee really pushes back from. And her appearance is, you know, taking on these kind of masculine attributes as well. So I think that there's an interesting division in kind of, yeah, their sexual politics there that kind of then bleeds into their, their work as well. Merci beaucoup. Je pense qu'on va donc terminer la séance maintenant. Thanking our speaker. Excellent. Thank you.